So hi everyone. And you can see that Gail and I are wearing our coats because <laughs> we're in Flagstaff and it's freezing. We got our turquoise earrings on, but that was just a coincidence. Um, so I'm happy to zoom in. I'm really happy to not have to drive home <laughs> tonight. And so I really apologize for not like asking Gail to poll you on uh, as to what you think your problems are. So I, I kind of guess. So I put it together this presentation of things that I've seen, maybe things that we've gotten calls about. And you know, if there's something that I don't mention you want to know a little bit about, you can ask. I can't guarantee that I will have the answer, but I do have some books around me and um, I don't have my loop. So sometimes I have a little magnifying glass that I that I have. And so if somebody asked you a problem, you pull out your little magnifying glass and you're just like, it just allows you time to think. You pretend you're looking at something, but it's like, what is it? What is it? I know I know the answer. So anyway, then people think you're really, really smart. But having a magnifying glass is really a great tool for gardeners. And we don't really think about that because sometimes we just have to really look at our plants. So I'm going to pull up my PowerPoint presentation. And there's, um, there are some recommendations on what to do with problems here. And so there's a lot of information, um, but you can go back and re review the recording. So if you say, oh, I got powder and mildew, what am I gonna do about it? You'll be able to um, find it. And so here's my PowerPoint, which is, I have to say the most exciting slide I've ever made in my history of working with Cooperative Extension. So I'm just going to, I'm going to talk about um, insect pests, diseases, and other plant problems. And there are other things that can cre create problems such as, you know, some critters in the garden or even some weeds, but I felt like that would be like a four hour class and a four hour Zoom class on a Wednesday evening is not a good thing. So, um, but one of the things I want to talk about is integrated pest management. And that's so we make the right choices when we're trying to solve our problems. And, you know, often we might see an insect and we go, oh, what am I going to spray? And so you want to grab, grab something. But sometimes if we look at a combination of methods, we might be able to do something um, that's a cultural solution instead of having to just pull out um, a pesticide and use it. And so integrated pest management is a combination of met methods. And um, what you do is you try to use um, the least amount of product to get the results that you need. And, and so um, it is better you know, for the environment because we're not spraying things that we don't actually need. And so some of the things that you need to think about is you have to ID what the pest or the problem is instead of just you know, saying, oh, somebody's chewing my leaves, I'm going to spray that. Well, that might not be the problem. And so you might be spraying something that's not needed. And you might, it actually might be a, a, something that's annoying, but it might not actually be a true problem that you even um, have to treat. And so those are some of the things that we want to think about. But mostly I'm going to give you um, um, organic recommendations just because we're talking about a vegetable garden and that's what most people are interested in now. That might not have been the case 20 or 30 years ago, but now that is what people are asking. And there's more um, safe, safer products that you can use on your vegetable garden than there was maybe 30 or 40 years ago. So with integrated pest management, the real key is to monitor for pests. And for insects, it means maybe putting up some sticky traps so you can catch insects. So you can kind of see who's out there, what, who might be causing the problem. And, and sometimes if you're not paying a lot of attention, um, you might start having some aphids and then you go away for the weekend and you come back and all of a sudden there's this giant explosion of aphids. And so then you have this giant problem where you have to maybe spray a lot of project, product, but if you caught it early, maybe you could have hosed them off with water or maybe used you know, a little safer soap. And so that's um, for integrated pest management, uh, monitoring is the key. So you can catch it early because it's easier to treat things early than when you have a giant problem. So then you're gonna use either biological control. Now we don't always have um, a natural predator or a pathogen. 
um, to control pests, but sometimes there are things available and we'll talk about a few. Um, sometimes it can be pretty expensive. Sometimes you can purchase a natural predator and then it'll fly away. And so you've just wasted $40. Um, so there may be a pro there may be a solution and there may not, but you know, if you want to use invite natural predators into your garden, you might want to plant plants that would attract those um, beneficial insects that might help control problem insects. So with cultural control, the key of course is to have a healthy garden. And so that's why you're taking this class to learn how to garden and healthy plants can handle some insect and disease problems um, or insect damage and some disease problems. If plants are stressed, they're gonna have more problems. And when we teach the Master Gardener class, um, when we talk about plant diseases, we talk, talk about the plant spiral of death. And so it starts with having a plant that's kind of stressed and then you don't water it correctly and then you don't fertilize it correctly. And then all of a sudden you have a whole host of problems and your plant dies and you hate gardening and um, you know, life just isn't good. So watering correctly is really key. Um, of course, controlling weeds is key because a lot of weeds could harbor viruses or maybe um, attract insects to your garden. Crop rotation is really important for many fungal problems in the vegetable garden. And then also something that's really key is sanitation. And that means cleaning up your garden um, either, you know, at the end of the year, of course, but also, you know, um, when your beans are done, well, get rid of everything so you don't have them there. Um, if they had some kind of a disease problem, it might remain in your garden. Then with mechanical control, you might be able to um, use a floating row cover to keep pests or insect pests out. You might do something like tilling in the fall that can uncover weed seeds um, so that um, maybe they germinate and they die off or it might uncover um, eggs for certain pests and they dry out so they die or you might be able to use something like a sticky traps that can attract insects so you're not going to have to spray as much. And then finally when we've tried all those things or maybe we don't even have one of those options then we'll look at chemical controls and we'll look at um, usually the least toxic organic control and then work in um, there are some organic controls that are more toxic to bee populations so you know, that might be a second choice. And then when we have to go to a synthetic product, we might need that, but then you've made a choice to use it. It's not that first thing that you're gonna choose. And there are cases when, if you have a giant outbreak, sometimes a synthetic product is really the best choice. So um, we're gonna talk about insects first. And the key, of course, is to ID the pest. And many of you know our little friend on the left here, a tomato hornworm. So he's pretty bad when he gets in your tomatoes. And I um, had him on, I had one on one tomato plant. And he, you know, like I went out there and like one day, a quarter of my tomato plant was gone because they eat a lot. And that was really annoying. But it, it was pretty easy to tell that he was the one or she was that was doing um, the damage. Not all insects are bad. We do get calls into the master gardener office when somebody sees an insect and they think, oh, you know, my garden's infested. It may be a problem, it may not. So ID in the pests is really key. Gail and I can help with that somewhat. Um, we've seen some insects, but there's some things I haven't seen. And if it's a true, it's a real problem, um, we can send samples down to the University of Arizona because they have, um, um, a cure an entomology curator that'll ID insects for us. And so of course use the least toxic method first. And you know, and one of the things is is we really don't want to um, kill off our good guys. Um, we'd like to kill off our bad guys. And when you're spraying something, sometimes you're going to damage a lot more than just that pest that you really want to get rid of. And of course some plants can handle some damage. Um, it might not be that attractive, but um, you know, it just depends on the problem. And there are some things that can be controlled by, you know, either trapping or hand picking or squashing. A squash bug will not come back. Um, you can also use a shop vac. Um, I have not done that, but I've read about it. When I was a kid, my dad, we had a lot of grapes and we had um, 
Japanese beetles, my dad would give me a can of kerosene and I would pick off the Japanese beetles and drop them in the can. And um, I can't remember if he even paid me for that, but that was just a way that he controlled his Japanese um, beetles on his conquer grapes. And of course you can use physical barriers like a floating row cover. And then again, I already mentioned, you know, what are your cultural practices? Make sure you have really, really healthy plants because they're gonna be able to handle um, pest problems better. So there, insects create a lot of products that we can use to ID who's causing the problem or give you a hint of who might be causing the problem. And I don't, I don't know a lot of these, but if you can become familiar with these, this can help you figure out um, what's going on because we not, might not be able to see that insect. And I just have a couple slides here that we'll go through. And this first one, we're looking at the exoskeleton of um, insects. And so that might be white flies. It could be something like that. Um, it could be some thrips, usually thrips are on the back. But when you see these little flecks like that, that could give you an indication of the size of the insect that might be causing the problem. Um, this is um, sooty mold. And so uh, aphids and thrips and mites um, will excrete um, um, like a sugary substance, you know, they take in a lot of moisture and they um, excrete um, uh, sap. Well, we call it sap, but it's basically insect pee, but it has, um, it has a tendency to grow mold on it. And so when you see this mold on, it, on um, plant leaves, it's usually because you have aphids. And Usually you can just spray this stuff off, but it would be a sign of what it would be a sign of what insect is creating the problem. The mold doesn't really create a problem, but it is unsightly. And I guess if you had enough of it that covered the leaf surface, your plant not might not be able to photosynthesize. These are fecal spots, and I'm not very good at identifying these things, but this is where your hand lens would come in handy um, if you see these little black dots on your leaves. Of course, um, protective cases. Um, this is um, not something we're gonna see here. This is just a picture of what a case would look like. Um, this, uh, I can't remember, this is a, uh, like a bagworm. And so there are some things like that that you can see. You might not be able to see the insect, but you might see its little house that it's made. And then of course, um, these are um, brass or the insect poop. And so that's usually, um, something to really look at, but I have to say, I don't think about it when I'm looking at plant, plant problems. And often, you know, I'll say, oh, I don't know what this is. And then somebody will say, insect poop. So, you know, just keep your, keep an open mind when you're trying to identify these problems. And then of course, when you see this fluffy, white, waxy stuff that could indicate that you have a scale insect. So there are other things that you can look for than just the insect when you're trying to figure out what's going on. Oh, and then of course, I forgot about that one, um, like the silk or the webbing, and this is something you might, uh, that a bagworm would make. So when we're looking at um, plant or damage to our vegetable plants, there's two categories that can help us figure out what's going on. And sometimes we don't even have to identify the insect, but on the left, we see um, damage that's caused by piercing or sucking mouth parts. And that's when the insect is, you know, um, attacking these individual cells and sucking juice out of the leaves. And this can cause a lot of wrinkling of the leaves. And you might see stippling of the leaves um, from where that insect was attacking the leaf. So that's one kind of damage. On the right, we see chewing damage. And so we see that with a lot of caterpillars when they're causing damage. And so, you know, understanding how the damage is, what kind of damage is happening, even if you can't quite identify the problem, can give you a little bit of um, information on how to treat. And with the chewing mouth parts, if you can get something on that leaf that's gonna interfere with that insect or maybe be toxic to it, it's gonna eat that when it's eating the leaf. So that could be how you might treat that problem. With piercing sucking um, insects, a lot of times they're on the leaf, they're sucking. And so sometimes it's actually easy to spray a product 
on them. And so that's kind of a challenge, you know, if you're spraying, sometimes you have to hit the insect. Well, what if the insect's flying around? They're kind of hard to hit. So here's some um, chewing examples and there's a whole bunch um, and we'll um, look at most of these. And of course our favorite one is our grasshopper. So how many, um, I can't see everybody, but um, cabbage loopers, I was gonna say, hey, everybody raise your hand if you've had a cabbage looper, but um, these actually are pretty easy to identify, but you do have to look for them and you would find them on broccoli, cabbage, turnip and radish. Um, those are the common crops, but um, you know, when you see these, um, I actually haven't seen a whole lot of them since I've lived in Northern Arizona. I did see a lot more of these in Pennsylvania, but you'll see ragged chewing um, of the leaves. And so that's um, the caterpillar or the larval state that's doing the chewing. And these actually are pretty easy to hand pick if you have a small garden. If you have an acre or so, that's gonna be a different um, matter. So um, it just depends on you know, your gardening situation. But one product that works really well for this is um, BT and that's Bacillus, Bacillus thuringiensis. And that is um, a product that just affects um, certain insects. It doesn't affect all insects and it's somewhat specific to um, these um, usually these larval forms. And I have a slide a little later on um, that I'll, uh, where I'll talk to you a little bit more about it, but that's something that um, it's an organic product. It's not gonna affect us. It's not gonna affect bees. It's gonna affect these caterpillars. So it's really safe to use. Uh, it just doesn't last for a really long time. So that might be the, the problem with it. Um, and, you know, it costs, a, you know, um, a fair amount. It's not super expensive though. So um, corn earworms, um, I haven't grown corn actually um, in Arizona. I don't have enough land to do that or enough water for that matter. I did in Pennsylvania, but um, you know, these are these earworms that get into the, um, the tips of the developing ears. And you know, if you've ever opened a ear of corn and seen the top part is all chewed away and there's a lot of black stuff in there, that's the insect frass. And so it's really, um, you know, it's just really disturbing to see, but because it's a caterpillar, you can, you can use BT and, um, and spray those, but you have to spray those um, periodically um, because you have to, um, it, it only lasts for a couple of days. And you also can use a carbaryl dust. Carbaryl is, um, the brand name that most of us know is Seven, S-E-V-I-N. Of course, that is toxic to bees and it's something you wanna be cautious about, but there's nothing worse than picking a lovely ear of corn and having insect frass. But all you have to do is cut the top off of it because the rest of the corn will be fine. And there are a couple beneficial insects, lace wings, pirate bugs and damsel bugs, but the lace wings are the easiest to get. And again, with these beneficials, you need to have other plants that they might like so that they stay around your garden because they might fly away. Um, so that could be a problem. So cutworms, um, a lot, we could actually get a lot of calls about cutworms and um, there's a couple different kinds of cutworms. They could also be from um, scarab beetles too. Uh, and most of these live underground and they can damage your crop by cutting it off just above ground level, which is really annoying. Um, but sometimes you can put down um, something like a piece of cardboard and they'll crawl up under there and you can, you know, and then you can catch them um, and dig them up. Of course, chickens absolutely love these things, but you don't really want your chickens running around your garden going after these because they'll eat all your vegetable plants too. Um, but BT again is something that you can use for this. And then of course, if you need something um, stronger than BT, carbaryl or seven, um, could be used for that. And actually cutworms, you know, there's many, many different kinds and they can affect all kinds of um, vegetable plants. So I've had a couple calls from Paige actually about earwigs and I actually, I never thought earwigs were a problem um, because I just associated them with um, decaying vegetation. 
But when th there's a large um, explosion in their population, they can actually affect um, live vegetation and they can do a lot of chewing damage. And, um, but sometimes, um, they, they can be causing the damage or sometimes they're just there because there's dead vegetation. So it's, you kind of have to pay attention to, uh, to um, if they're doing the chewing or not. And so you can lay out rolls of newspaper in the evening. Now earwigs like it dark, they like it um, um, kind of damp and they'll crawl in there and then you can just pick up your newspaper and have your way with your earwigs. So they aren't um, a caterpillar, so BT will not work on them. And so um, the safest product probably is Carbaryl. There is another product called Spinosat that I'm gonna talk about a little later. Um, that is an organic product, um, but it does affect bees. And so the bad part about earwigs is that um, if you have this population explosion, they really will chew on just about anything. So that could be a sign that it's an earwig because it's, there's damage in all, all, all over your vegetable garden. And I know um, the Shan Garden that's at um, Northern Arizona University, they put in a um, straw bale garden and they brought in a lot of compost when they made that straw bale garden and it had a lot of earwigs and they had an earwig um, population explosion that really did a lot of damage. So it can happen. I don't know if that, that has happened on Paige. The calls I got from Paige were, actually earwigs on um, some ornamental plants. And of course, flea beetles, anybody that's grown um, broccoli and radishes and kale has probably seen flea beetles. They're pretty small and um, they kind of hop around a lot. Um, so they're kind of hard to spray. And so um, you can cover your plants that can help them. Um, when you see these little, um, like shot holes in radish leaves, that's a sign that you have flea beetles. And one of the things you could do if you really don't wanna have, um, I have seen them do a lot of damage on some plants and just completely wipe out certain plants, but you could actually have a radish um, crop like maybe in a container away from your garden because they like radish more than anything else. And maybe they'll go over there and feed and not bother your other plants. You can use a pyrethrum dust. Now there's pyrethroid, with, which is synthetic, but pyrethrum is what's from chrysanthemums. And that's actually what I used to use in Pennsylvania. And I, we do actually have some in our house now. Pyrethrum though, even though it's organic, it still, still can be pretty toxic. And so you have to be careful with it. It of course can um, affect bees. And then of course there's Carbaryl, which is seven. And also you can use Spinosad, which is um, an organic product. Okay. So those are pretty easy to identify, um, but um, they are very, very small. And I think um, some new gardeners have been a little bit of surprised at how much damage these small little insects can cause. So um, I, I, I don't have any other slides about skeletonizers, but there are certain insects that will um, eat in between the veins of a leaf. And so that's a pretty easy way to identify that it's a skeletonizer. Some of these insects are very specific to what they'll eat. And this is a picture of the great leaf skeletonizer. And so if you see somebody chewing in between the veins and it's on your grape, you can kind of put those two pieces of information together and figure out what the problem is. And, um, and entomologists are very clever when they're naming insects. It's like, oh, it's on a grape leaf. Well, let's call it a grape leaf skeletonizer. And so um, BT again will um, affect bees because it is um, a caterpillar. And of course the pyrethrum dust. And again, you'd put the dust on the leaves and then they would eat the dust. And so that that's actually better um, than spraying because you're going to control where you're putting the dust. And then of course there's grasshoppers. And I don't know how bad of a problem grasshoppers are in PAGE, but they can be a real problem in Flagstaff. And it really depends um, 
which year it is. Um, and sometimes it's on the east side of the town, sometimes it's on the west side of town, sometimes it's just down in the Verde Valley, you know, and so when it's a problem, it can be a problem. And we have had years um, where some people have said they've just eaten their entire garden, there's nothing they can do about it. But one thing you can do is cover your plants with the row cover. That's a way to um, control insects from getting on your vegetable plants. And of course, in page, you're a little bit warmer than we are in Flagstaff, but you can use the lightest weight floating row cover. But if you see in this picture down in the bottom, this is, um, this is not floating row cover, but this is another type of um, row cover. It's called tough bell. We don't use that anymore, but you can see these holes in here on this row cover and this is where grasshoppers ate the row cover. So, you know, if they're hungry enough, they might need anything. And of course, chickens are great for eating them, but of course they chase them around. Um, but chickens will also eat your garden. Um, and the one thing that people have found that's, you know, a good organic product is something called no low bait. And that's this no see, no, um, no sema, Locuste. No, I don't know how to pronounce that. I'm going to say no low bait. And so that is um, um, a product that just affects the gut of the caterpillar. And because caterpillars are cannibals, um, so if you apply this early, the small caterpillars will eat it. Now, remember, many of these products, particularly organic products, work a lot better on smaller insects um, than larger insects. So the little caterpillars eat it, it affects their gut lining, they die. And then the bigger caterpillars eat the little caterpillars. So they become infected with this. And I can't remember if it's a type of bacteria. Um, I just don't remember right now, but it's not something that affects anything, but ca just the, the caterpillars and it's the gut lining. And so it's pretty effective. But again, you might be using this product and your neighbor isn't using anything. And so those caterpillars will come over to your yard to, you know, eat your caterpillars that have died. But it is the way of keeping the population under control. In really, really bad situations, um, I haven't had to use this a lot because I don't live in an area that has a lot of caterpillars, but many master gardeners have said they've had to use a carburel that's in a bran bait. And so this is something that you can sprinkle around your garden and um, the grasshoppers are attracted to the bran and then it has the carburel or seven in there. And so then they eat that and they die very, fairly quickly. Um, and so it's a pretty safe product because you're not spraying it anywhere. So it's not gonna spray, it's not gonna affect any bees. It's really um, fairly specific now dogs or cats could also eat this brand product and it wouldn't be good for them to eat in carbo. I, I don't, if they ate enough of it, it would probably make them pretty sick, but they would have to eat a fair amount, but it is something you would, would want to think about. And if you have kids that are playing around in your garden, you might um, not want to use something like this, but it is pretty effective. Um, and you know, I've talked to some master gardeners and 30 years ago, they just sprayed malathion, but that's a pretty toxic product. And so this um, using carbaryl and a bait would be a much safer way to control something like this. So I snitched this picture, I actually snitched several, several of these pictures, but I got this from um, Yapapai County um, master gardeners. And I just thought this was kind of a curious picture, but you know, sometimes you can see this damage and you go, it's got to be something's chewing on my leaves. And, and this is actually lesser goldfinch damage. <laughs> so I wouldn't want to have to treat for lesser goldfinches. I would like to enjoy my goldfinches. But, um, you know, sometimes you can find damage and it's just, um, it's hard to figure out if it's from an insect or maybe in our case in Flagstaff, it could be hail damage sometimes. And we weren't home that weekend when we had a 20 minute hail storm that caused a lot of damage. So it does mean you have to be observant and just um, you know, look at your plants a lot and be out in your garden. So um, I think this might be our last chewing insect, but uh, here's our tomato hornworm. And if you know, um, they are pretty big, um, I usually show a slide that has um, a picture of somebody's hand in them because they can be several inches long. 
and they really can do a lot of damage. Um, and the easiest thing to do is to hand pick them if you only have a handful of tomato plants. Um, so there are um, ladybugs and lacewings will eat the eggs. Um, you can use BT, that's really effective. So if you had a larger area, and of course, tilling the soil um, can um, affect the eggs and kill off the eggs. So you're not gonna have as much of a population um, next year. And of course, this is a really interesting picture here in the middle. This is a um, tomato hornworm that has parasitic wasp eggs on it. I just admitted somebody. I feel like I have power when I let somebody into this class. <laughs> So anyway, and so um, here are these wasps eggs. And so this um, tomato hornworm isn't, um, it's not gonna have a very good time of it, but I, um, there's a company in Tucson called Aborico, and that's where you can order some, um, some of these beneficial insects. They have a great catalog. Um, they're really great. You can call them and say, this is my problem, and they're really good about it. But it just depends how much money you want to spend, because sometimes this can be fairly expensive. But if you have, you know, if you're growing lots and lots of tomato plants, this might be, and, and tomato hornworms have, have been a constant problem. This might be the route you want to go instead of having to, um, to spray something. And we also have the tobacco hornworm. It looks very similar to the tomato hornworm and they um, both can do a lot of damage. Okay. And I guess if you have any questions, um, you can holler or type it into the chat box and Gail um, can ask. So those are the common chewing insects that I know of in vegetable gardens. And there might be some other ones, um, but those are the ones I've seen or heard about or have had people ask questions about. We also have our piercing sucking insects. And so those, um, not quite as many, but they can cause a lot of problems. And so we have aphids, the leaf hoppers. Um, there are several other types of hoppers such as the grape leaf hopper, squash bugs, um, stink bugs, and thrips. And I have to say, I don't have any information about stink bugs. And there is a, that's a picture of a stink bug here. I've had several master gardeners say that stink bugs create lots and lots of problems, but nobody's ever asked me how to solve the problem. So I actually don't know <laughs> right now. And now I'm thinking I should probably go look it up. And for some reason, I think that people from, I'm just thinking it could be a problem in page. I think it's probably a problem everywhere. So. Um, I didn't, I have the picture, but I didn't include um, a solution for that. But the one we have, most of us have a big problem with um, are aphids. And the biggest problem with aphids is that they have a very short um, life cycle and they can give birth to live aphids without having, um, a female can give birth to live aphids without even meeting up with the male aphid. And so it can create a really big population explosion. And you can see these little baby aphids. They look just like mom right there. Um, and they can really, really um, um, completely have a population explosion. But in the hardest parts of the summer, um, the heat isn't as good for them, but um, I usually think of the problems happening in Flagstaff, per, you know, usually into August, but you might maybe not see problems into ju in July and August, but maybe in late September, early October. Um, and there are different kinds of aphids. So it does depend on the kind of aphid. There is a rose aphid that's rosy colored that we get in Flagstaff. I've, I haven't seen it um, or heard about it in other um, parts of town, but you know, there are, different kinds, some of them are black. A lot of the ones we see in the vegetable garden are green. Um, when you're thinking you might have aphid problems, you might see some curling or cupping of the leaves because the aphids are sucking them, but you can also look for the honeydew and that's um, that um, their aphid pea basically, that basically has um, carbohydrates and some nitrogen in there. So you know this, you know, if you're ever at a, at a picnic, you want to make sure you cover your potato salad because if you're under a tree, there might be aphid P 
he falling down. Um, but you can also look for ants because ants will um, um, actually farm the aphids. And so sometimes we'll get calls, well, I have all these ants on my plant. What do I do about the ants? The ants aren't really the problem. It's the aphids that are pro the problem and the ants are attracted to the aphids. And of course, ladybugs and lacewings are really good about, um, you know, they love aphids. And um, the easiest thing is to use a high pressure hose and just blast them off because once an aphid falls off, it's really hard for it to get back on the plant. Um, they're usually just floating around in the air and then they drop onto leaves. They don't really crawl up onto plants, but you know, you all don't have much water. We don't have much water. And so, you know, you might want to um, uh, not um, use a high pressure hose just because you'd be using a lot of water and you'd have to do this every couple of days. You can use an, an insecticidal soap. Um, and there are some you can make it yourself or you can buy it um, pre-made. And sometimes insecticidal soap will have pyrethrum in there, uh, but um, you have to hit the aphid. And so that means you have to spray on the bottoms of the leaves if they're underneath the leaves. And so it can be somewhat tedious and, and people um, have a hard time keeping it under control because you have to do it regularly. And sometimes you just wanna say, well, I just wanna do it once, <laughs> but that's not the way it is for aphids. Um, so they affect all kinds of plants. Um, they will affect tomatoes and peppers and things like that, but they're really common on, um, well, kale is where I've, you know, just, okay, I guess we're not having kale for dinner tonight because it's completely covered with aphids. And so um, it's just something that you have to get under control and stay on top of it. Um, so you don't have this population explosion. And of course, once you start seeing ladybugs, that means you probably have aphids because they are um, attracted to them. Okay. So another problem that we have is the beet leaf hopper. And so the problem with the beet leaf hopper is, is that it carries curly top virus and it can transmit that virus to your plants. And it's a giant problem in the Verde Valley. Um, it is a problem now in Dhoni Park. I don't know if this is a problem in Page, but depending on how the winds blow, it could be possible that beet leaf hoppers could be up in your neck of the woods. And um, so sometimes it's a matter of managing the weeds that beet leaf hoppers are really attracted to, and the weeds can also harbor the virus. Um, sometimes you might want to put a floating row cover um, over the plants. And this is a picture of the beet leaf hopper. It's just a small little um, insect, but it can do a lot of damage because it can spread this virus around. And so um, in this picture on the top, you can see the infected plant. You need to get rid of it because it would be really easy for a beet leaf hopper to feed on the infected plant and then transmit that virus to a new plant. And so for the Verde Valley, um, they manage this problem by planting after the beet leaf hopper is made its big population explosion in May or June. And so that might not be an op option for the page area, but I left, I put this in here because it just might be something that you have experienced. But um, one of the ways you can see if you have this as a problem is put out those sticky traps and see if you catch any of these insects. And um, then think about, um, well, if you only, caught one or two, maybe you can cover your plants. Maybe you also want to use an um, insecticide to control the problem. And then of course we have our squash bugs and um, this is the little baby squash bugs um, starting to grow. And so here we'll see wilting leaves. Um, squash bugs can also transmit viruses uh, and Gail and I had gone to the Payson Community Garden and looked at some of their squash plants and they never figured out if that was a squash bug problem on the squash that were doing poorly or if it was a virus problem or if it was some kind of insect. And this is when samples had been sent down to the um, plant pathologist and the entomologist at the University of Arizona. So sometimes it's just really hard to figure out what's going on. And 
But here, you know, if you can find egg clusters, you can try to destroy them. You can use insecticidal soap. Neem oil, um, neem oil is from a tree from India and it's pretty effective on insects that are small. It is not effective on larger in, insects. Neem oil is also somewhat systemic. So that means it's in the plant. And so the insects, when the sucking insects suck on leaves, they would take in the neem oil. I'm actually not sure if we want to eat neem oil, but it's considered an organic product. I actually never thought about that because it does have a systemic quality to it. Um, but I've never heard anybody anybody um, think that, that it was a problem and it is listed as an organic product that's safe to use. Um, neem oil also can have fungicidal properties. So a lot of organic growers do like to use neem oil. So you can also try to trap the adults for the squash bugs. And of course, sanitation, getting rid of old plant material is gonna really help. And then two organic products um, that work on squash bugs. Now, this isn't a caterpillar, so we can't use BT or Bexillus thuringiensis, but pyrethrum, which is from chrysanthemums, and then spinosad, which I'll talk about um, a little bit more later. And of course, squash bugs affect pumpkin squash, cucumber, and melon. I haven't had um, squash bugs in my garden here, but many, many people in Dony Park and then up onto the Navajo Reservation have a lot of problems with squash bugs. So it is something to, you know, if you've had a problem to think about before you start planting your plants, how are you going to tackle this problem and have a healthy plant? Make sure you water enough, maybe. Um, um, inspect your plants regularly so you can try to uh, catch the adults. And also if you can um, treat these plants when the insects are small, you're gonna have to use a lot less product. And then of course we have thrips. It's either one thrips or it's many thrips. It's all the same. And so these are very, very small insects. And I mostly see these on floral crops or on lilacs and roses and things like that. They can affect apple blossoms too. I've had master gardeners tell me that they've seen a lot of thrips on onions and garlic. Um, so they can affect many different plants. I haven't seen it as a big problem, um, but other gardeners have had it as a problem and they are sucking insects. So as you can see in this upper picture, a lot of curled cupping of the leaves, that's a sign that it's a sucking insect. And you can see these little speckling spots on the leaves where they have been sucking on those um, cells and, and affecting those cells. And so um, sticky traps are a great way to see if you have thrips. The other way you can tell if you have thrips is so you have um, some bean flowers that don't look very good. Hold your bean flowers on top of a white sheet of paper and shake it and then look at your white sheet of paper. And if you see these little tiny specks running around, you have thrips. And so it's just a really easy way to ID them. And um, sometimes if they're on like bean blossoms, like they are in this picture up here, you're gonna have to cut off all those effect, infected buds and blooms. It's probably, you probably would just need to get rid of your bean um, plants because Beans don't flower, you know, on and on like tomato plants do. So um, you could use um, neem oil, particularly if you um, detect the problem before it's a major problem, you can use neem oil or insecticidal soap. Insecticidal soap is how a lot of rose um, growers and flagstaff treat um, their roses for thrips. And of course, um, ladybugs really like them too. Okay. And then last of our insect category are spider mites, which actually aren't insects, but we put them in that category. And so this is another um, group of plants and many of them like really hot, dry conditions. And that's when we see problems um, here and they, um, they're sucking insects. So they're gonna cause this puckering of the leaves. They also um, will cause the speckling of the leaves and they cause some webbing. And you can see the webbing on this picture on the, on the right. And so that's an indication that you have spider mites. Sometimes they're really, really small and you're not gonna see them with your little hand lens. Um, 
So you look for these, sign, these um, signs of this webbing and the little speckling on the leaves. And you can use insecticidal soaps on these. Insecticidal soaps um, work um, because they interfere with, um, they cause, um, they cause these insects to suffocate. Well, they're not insects, they're mites. They cause them to su suffocate. But when you're trying to treat mites, you usually use a product that's called a miticide, not an insecticide. And that's um, because they really, they're not insects and they just don't quite have the same physiology as an insect. But insecticidal soaps, because they um, smother um, small organisms, that's why an insecticidal soap will also work on a mite. And um, yeah, so that's all I have to say about that. So we have, I'm just going to list two beneficials here. Of course, our lady beetles or our ladybugs. And here's one here on the left. The biggest problem is, is that we really like them to stay and they like to leave. And so, you know, you buy 2000 ladybugs and then they're all gone the next day. And what we really like to figure out is how to get the larva to stay because the larvas are machines as far as eating aphids. And they do look like little dinosaurs. Some people actually bring these into the extension office. They're worried they've got some kind of chewing insect on their plants, but it's just somebody that's chewing on all the aphids. And if we could figure out how to buy larval lady beetles and have them in our garden, maybe we can get the ladybugs to stay around a little bit longer. So that might be um, the cottage industry that somebody can start up. But these, you know, you can buy these at nurseries, you can mail order them. And, um, and their populations will explode when you have lots and lots of aphids. But once the population goes down, then they might go someplace else. And there are also the lace wings. That's something else you could mail order. And they, um, the, um, the adults feed on nectar, pollen, and honeydew, but it's the larva. That is one funny looking little larva there, but it'll feed on aphids and other small insects and on mites. And those are the two that are the easiest to get. There are a couple other ones. Um, and then there's some that are just pretty expensive for the homeowner to get hold of. And so a couple organic insecticides, of course, um, horticultural soaps like safer soap, um, but you can also make your own. And you can make your own by adding one to two tablespoons of liquid dish soap to a gallon of water. Um, and when you do this, the one that um, many extension folks recommend is using the simplest version of Dawn soap, not the ultra antibacterial scented stuff, a very simple, simple soap product. Some people use Dr. Bonner's. I've never used that one. I actually just buy it now because I don't need that much of it, but it is a really, really, um, inexpensive way to make um, a horticultural soap. Sometimes there's a little oil that's been added because that helps spread um, the product around when you're spraying it. And in this situation, I just have to remind you more is not better. And so we did have a case one time in Flagstaff where a landscaper said, well, it's soap, how bad can it be? So they used a cup of soap in a gallon of water. They sprayed a whole, um, a homeowner's entire um, landscape and they killed all the plants because it was too much soap, it affected the leaves. Um, so you should, you know, if you mix it up, um, test it before you spray your whole garden with it. And that's, you know, something that's just a wise thing to do. Sometimes you can buy these horticultural soaps with pyrethums in there. Um, and that's just that extra bit of control. But again, pyrethrums, um, they can affect bees and, you know, just because they're organic doesn't mean they're completely safe. So, but if you have a big pest problem, that might be the combo that you want to use. And that's just a picture of the pyrethrum. So it causes um, nerve system damage in insects. And then there's neem oil from the neem tree and that affects leaf miners, white flies, thrips, caterpillars, aphids, spider mites, et cetera, et cetera. You do have to be able to spray the insect, but again, because neem is a little, has systemic qualities, it might affect those sucking insects too. 
And I read there's a formulation for grubs, but I, have, I haven't seen that for sale. And of course, like many organic products, most effective on the smaller immature insects. And there's our Bacillus thuringiensis, which is the bacteria. And there's a couple different kite types. And so when you buy this, you might see BT and you'll see a K after it. And that's the Christaki. That's the one that's um, effective on caterpillars. Um, there's is Israelensis, which is for fly larvae. That's actually one of the ways that Arborico um, made a fair amount of money because they figured out um, how to develop this as a product. And um, then there's one that's for beetles. Uh, what's not listed on here is the one that's for mosquito larvae. And I don't remember which one it is, but if you have problems with mosquitoes, um, you can buy these things called little mosquito dunks. And that's what's in them is that it's Bexillus thuringiensis, but I don't know what, what type it is. Um, but that's an easy way to control um, mosquitoes in a body of water where you don't want to have to spray something in there. Um, you just maybe, you know, want to put these little dunks in. So it's pretty safe to use. And then this is the spinocide, which is from a soil bacterium. The story has to do with it came from a Rome factory in the Caribbean or something like that. So somehow it was discovered, extracted, it kills by ingestion, and it's used for many different insects. And 15 years ago, we thought this was going to be the organic solution for a lot of organic growers because it's pretty effective, but it is toxic to bees. So you have to be um, very careful about how to use this one. I first was told about this. There's something called um, Captain Jack's dead bug. And it's, you know, and I thought, oh, it's got to be this fancy organic product. Well, it's just been a sad, but it has a great name, Captain Jack's dead bug. So, um, and, but there are many other forms available now. And because people have asked for organic products, there are more organic products that are available. But again, read the label, follow the instructions don't use more than what you need to use. And remember to always choose the least toxic method for control and protect your beneficials and pollinators. And I snitched that picture from um, an extension agent that um, moved to North Carolina because there was more water. Um, so that's a praying mantis. And if you could get them to stay around, that would be a good thing too. So let's see what time. Okay, we still have um, a half an hour. So now we wanna talk about uh, managing disease and problems on plants. And so we have to know what the plant is. And so when I, talk, when I teach um, a class on this, I'm not talking just about vegetable gardens because sometimes people say, well, my purple flowered plant has a problem. We don't even know what they're talking about. With our vegetable gardens, it's a little easier. That's a radish, that's a kale, that's a bean, you know. Um, but you should understand what the plant's supposed to look like normally um, and what it looks like when it's healthy. And I think many of us know when our vegetable garden plants look good or not. And um, then we try to figure out what's causing the problem. And so this is a, um, a picture that one of our master gardeners sent me and he said, um, well, my potato plants have something weird growing on them and it's got to be a problem. What can I spray? And so actually on the left here, you can actually see the potato plant flower. And these are actually the potato fruit. Oftentimes we don't see potato fruit. Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't, but he had just never seen them before. And so this is actually not a problem, but he thought it was a problem because it was something that was different. Um, and in this picture here, this is on oak, but we see insect galls. And so sometimes those, you know, brown things like this are a problem, but oftentimes insect galls are just a cosmetic problem. They're not going to create a big problem in your garden, but it, it could be. So, you know, just being familiar with what your plants should look like is going to help you a lot. And so when we're thinking about a problem, um, and so we're not thinking about the insect problems. Now we're thinking about um, diseases or some other thing that's going wrong. And so um, the diseases are caused by pathogen, pathogens and we call, call those the biotic factors. And of course, pathogens are infectious, insects and weeds are not. Um, 
But we also have all those non-living factors and pests that might um, be causing some kind of damage. And there's all kinds of things that are non-living factors, such as weather, mechanical damage, a kid with a pocket knife, a pocket gopher, chemical injury. There's so many, many things. And in Arizona, because of our dry climate, um, between, um, according um, to Cooperative Extension, between 70 to 80% of our problems are caused by non-living factors and not pathogens. And it's just, we don't have the right climate for many of the fungal diseases that we see in other parts of the country. But when we have these non-living factors, um, living factors, it's really hard to figure out what's going on. But we'll talk about a couple common ones. Um, but sometimes you just have to think about, well, what am I doing? What's the weather been like? Has it been windy? What all has been happening at um, to your garden um, over time? And so um, we have the plant pathogens caused by fungi, bacteria, viruses, nematodes. There's a couple other ones, but um, for the most part, fungi cause the most problems, but we don't have that many fungal problems just because of our um, climate. And just a couple pictures is powdery mildew, um, curly top virus, which is a virus, and then these uh, microscopic nematodes. And I don't think I included nematodes in this discussion. So microscopic nematodes, so they're beneficial nematodes that you can purchase that will affect certain um, insects in your soil like grubs and things like that. Then there are these microscopic nematodes and they are a serious problem for um, some farmers in um, Yavapai County, um, Globe, Phoenix and places like that. And as far as I know, they haven't gotten to page yet. Flagstaff doesn't have them, we're too cold for them. And so um, if you see any root crops that have really, they're bumpy, really knotty looking, and I know you don't have that many rocks because you have just lots and lots of sand, you know, call me and let me know because let's see if that could be a problem. But as far as I know, they haven't gotten, um, into Northern Arizona. They're just in the Verde Valley region and in the Chino Valley region. So, um, but they are really, really tiny. You cannot see them even with a microscope. You, um, or you can see them with a really high quality microscope. But if you see um, the roots of beets, carrots, um, things like that, that are really knobby and lumpy and that you don't have any explanation, just um, give us a call and we can see if we can help you, you figure out what's going on. So, um, so those are the pathogens. So with the non-living factors and other pests. And so these are um, not insect pests, but those other things. And we call them abiotic, even though um, animals are living, but there's so many things like temperature extremes, you know, extreme cold, extreme um, heat, soil pH. You guys probably have a higher pH rather than a lower pH. That could be a problem for nutrient uptake the right amount of light, the right amount of moisture, um, nutrition, herbicide damage, cultural practices, mechanical injury, lightning damage, air pollution damage, salt damage, animal damage. There's so many things that can happen. This picture in the middle is sun scald and a pepper. On this plant on the right are um, zucchini. It's, um, it's a loss of turgor pressure. This plant actually will recover from this. It's not um, caused by squash bug. But the plant is trying to take up water to remain that um, to maintain that turgor pressure to keep it um, upright and um, and the leaves um, filled out. But it can't move enough water to maintain that turgor pressure because it's too hot or the root system is too small. I see this every afternoon in my zucchini plants in August, even though we water, um, and it's just it can't move enough water up through. This um, picture on the bottom is um, it's a physiological leaf roll that happens um, often in tomatoes. Um, seen it in Flagstaff a couple of times. I don't know if it happens in Page. And some of these things, you look at that and you go, it's got to be an insect, right? But in that case, it's not. And this um, zucchini, or I think it's a zucchini, it's just poor pollination. And so 
we consider that a non-living factor. Um, the, you know, the, um, it didn't get pollinated properly and so the fruit doesn't fill out properly. And um, some common non-living factors is blossom end rot. And so that looks like it's gotta be a fungal disease, but it's not, it's not infectious. It, and this has to do with um, a lack of calcium at the blossom end of the developing fruit. And again, you know, we need to have a lot of water moving up through our plants and moving um, minerals in the soil up into the plant where it's needed. And the one that's needed for fruit development is calcium. And so we might have enough calcium in the soil, but the plant isn't getting to the calcium to the blossom end of that tomato fruit. And so it's like try to maintain an even distribution of soil moisture. It's Northern Arizona, it's kind of a hard thing to do. And so a lot of us do see this problem. There's some cultivars that are more susceptible than others. Um, Romas are really susceptible. Early girl, which is not a very good tomato, but we grow it down here just because it's a short season one. Um, doesn't have, rarely gets it and, and um, better boy is another one. So if it's a problem, especially if you're trying to grow tomatoes and take them to the community market. You might want to think about which cultivars you're going to buy. And you can also get it on peppers. You can also get it on eggplant. You can actually get it on squash. I've never seen it on squash though, but we did see it on eggplant at our bus stop garden. So, um, you know, even soil moisture and, you know, having a bigger, um, um, a deeper soil. So you have a bigger root system that's, and that's gonna help you maintain that um, soil moisture um, for the plant. So we have a couple other tomato problems um, that are not caused by disease. And of course, irregular watering can um, um, cause this splitting of fruit. Sun scald can happen, especially if you thin your tomato plants and um, clip off the suckers. I don't do that because we have so much sunshine here. We don't want our tomatoes to get sunburn basically. And this one on the right is cat facing and that is, has to do with, um, it, there's a couple different things that cause this. Sometimes it's cool temperatures, sometimes it's irregular um, fertilis, um, pollination um, within the flower. And there's a couple other things that cause it, but this year we grew Cherokee purple tomatoes and the first one was absolutely the most beautiful tomato I've ever seen all the rest look like this. And it's just, it's kind of hard to make a BLT by slicing through this and have it be something you want to eat for um, your lunch. So anyway, I don't quite know what the problem was. It could have been just cool temperatures for us here, but we were not that cool this year. Um, so it might've just been the lack of pollinators, um, which is a problem that many of us have. Nitrogen deficiency, of course, can be a problem. We'll see it in the oldest part of the, the oldest leaves because it's mobile within the plant. And so um, it, um, the newer leaves will be um, green, but the older leaves will usually be yellow. And it'll also cause your plants to be stunted and have premature um, formation of like broccoli heads like we see in this um, lower picture. And of course, side dressing with nitrogen is gonna help that problem, but sometimes you have to think about, well, how am I going to get nitrogen into my plants in a hurry? And of course, a synthetic product is going to move it in there a, um, a lot faster, but there are many um, other products and maybe a fish um, emulsion might be something that you'd want to use. And then all the neighborhood cats would come to your house to visit your garden because you use a fish emulsion. So that's something that you think about, but you can certainly side dress with compost that could help. Um, but sometimes, you know, if you want to get something in quickly, it might be using a foliar spray or some kind of liquid um, fertilizer. And then iron chlorosis, um, we see that, so we can see this in soils that are have a higher pH, particularly when the pH is over 7.5 and you will see yellowing in between the veins um, and the problem is, is there might be iron in the soil, but a higher pH, sometimes those plants can't take up that um, iron. And so it means trying to work 
um, with your soil to lower that pH. Jim Mass probably said add organic matter. That would be one way to help the soil pH. Also adding elemental sulfur can help with that too. And of course, herbicide damage. Um, and we do see this um, occasionally. Oftentimes it's because somebody used a weed and feed on their lawn and there might have been, um, you know, they watered and then maybe there was some drift or something like that. But um, these are really hard to identify. We do get a couple calls a year about these kinds of problems. But, you know, think about, you know, what kind of herbicides are being used um, because 2,4-D will um, affect dicots. Um, so it's, this is a geranium up here. This is tomato down here. And usually this causes this cupping of the leaves. But, so you might look at it and go, wow, that maybe that's insect damage. Maybe it's aphid damage. But if you really look through the plants, you put out your sticky traps, you don't see any insects, then you wonder what your neighbor was up to. But um, it's always better to um, give your neighbor zucchini and then talk to them about, hey, what do you, well, your lawn looks great. What are you using to treat your lawn? But zucchinis can really help that conversation. So we have some fun, fungal problems. And again, we don't have that many, but here we have um, powdery mildew. And I just put this slide in here, but I honestly, I can't remember what that problem is. It might be, um, it might be um, early blight on tomato. And so the common one are the seedling and transplant plant diseases. Gail already talked to you about, um, you know, starting your plants. And so of course the key to that is to have healthy, fast growing plants, sanitation, and sometimes you might have to rotate your plants year after year if you have a problem in certain flower beds. And so this is, you know, when we see damping off of seedlings or root rot and transplants. And of course the saddest thing in the world is to see your little plants start growing and then to fall over like that. And so having a sterile potting soil is really gonna help and using cleaning your containers or, um, you know, dipping them in a 10% bleach, bleach solution. And here we usually don't see um, these fungal diseases in bedding plants because a lot of fungicides are used in the bedding plants. So we often don't see those when we're purchasing plants in the nursery. But if you see a flat like this, even if it's on sale, run, don't buy it because that means it might have some kind of um, um, pathogen in the soil and you don't want to introduce that into your garden. Um, our powdery mildews, powdery mildews, there's about 300 different species. This is powdery mildew on grape powdery mildew on melon, powdery mildew on bean. Powdery mildew on melon doesn't affect powdery mildew on bean. They're fairly specific, but we call them all powdery mildew because they have this white mycelium, sorry. And um, the spores don't need free water to cause infection, so they're unlike other fungi. And so that's why it's a bigger problem for us. Um, the biggest problem is, is that if there's lots of mycelium all over the leaves, it might affect photosynthesis, but usually it's just a cosmetic problem and you can take off the most damaged leaves. It usually doesn't kill the plant, but it's kind of, kind of not attractive sometimes. And so um, there are disease resistant varieties and anytime you have a problem consistently in your garden, if you can figure out what the problem is and you can by a variety that has resistance, then you're not going to have to spray anything. And of course, um, spacing out the plants can help having better air circulation. And of course, removing some of that plant material that's infected and don't put it in your compost pile. Don't put it back into your garden, just get rid of it. And sulfur does work pretty well, um, but you don't want to, oops, sorry. Um, you don't want to use it um, when the temperature is above 90 degrees because it could affect the plants. Um, you can use um, this calagreen, which is a potassium bicarbonate. You can also use baking soda and mix um, a few, two and a half tablespoons of baking soda with a gallon of water and a little bit of mineral oil is effective. But again, these potassium bicarbonate and sodium bicarbonate will only um, help in the beginning. If you have a massive amount of powdery mildew and your daughter's getting married next week and you really want your garden to look great and it's everywhere. This is not, those types of products will not solve the problem. The fungicide that's used in, I'm not even gonna try to pronounce this. I've tried many times. Um, 
oh wait, chlorothalonil. Um, that's one that you will find, oops, in the nurseries and that's effective and recommended for most fungal problems. But again, you'll have to read the label because it can be used on vegetable crops, but there's gonna be a period of time where you're not gonna to wanna to consume those vegetables. But reading the label is key to that. We also have vascular wilts. Verticillium wilt is the most common one. Um, and, oh, that picture of that tomato before was actually verticillium wilt on tomato. But this is what happens to your plant. And um, it's pretty heartbreaking when this happens. And we used to have problems when we purchased seed that some of these fungal pathogens would be within the seed. We rarely see that anymore. So that has probably the last 20 years, we don't have we don't bring in um, pathogens on the seed. Um, it could be a problem if you have a seed library and somebody's um, introducing infected seed into the seed library. But usually people would not be collecting seeds from something like this to introduce into the seed library. So I think it's really a minor, minor concern. So for verticillium wilt, there is no control for it but there are many, many resistant varieties. So if you think you have a problem, that's something you can think about. Crop rotation is gonna help because it can um, remain in the soil. And of course, weeds um, could have it. Uh, and then you might have insects move um, the fung fungus around. And of course, sanitation is always key. So we just have a couple more. Um, well, I'm watching my time. So early blight on tomato and so Gail, got to know this one last year. You see these concentric rings on the leaves. And so uh, this is a fungal disease. It can be a major problem. It, it, I think it just, um, sometimes you might get it on some plant material. Um, I actually don't know how you would, it might come in on, on um, plant material sometimes. That's probably the, um, the main way that you might get it. But this is caused by alternaria and it causes those um, necrotic spots, those halos on leaves and just all kinds of terrible looking fruit that you're not gonna wanna eat these lesions on the stem. And of course the fruit drop prematurely, that's not very good. So use pathogen free seed, but again, most of our seed likely is path pathogen free and just get rid of the plant material, don't compost it, get rid of it. And then of course, um, one of the things is, is you might not want to um, let your little volunteer tomato plants, if you compost it and all of a sudden you get these little volunteer tomato plants, um, they could harbor some of the pathogen to avoid overhead irrigation and um, space out the plants. But there are tomato cultivars that are resistant. And of course the main fungicide that's used for that is this chlorothalonil. I don't know if neem oil can be used for early blight, but I kind of doubt it. Um, then we have late blight and late blight is caused by um, the same pathogen that caused the potato famine in I Ireland. And, you know, it looks a little sim similar, but it usually comes in a little bit later in the season. Um, it's Phytophthora infestans and it causes necrotic spots, but you're not going to see that halo. Um, and this has come in occasionally on bedding plants. Um, and it's just, um, I think we saw more disease last year because the nurseries were pushing to get plants out the door because we were always, we were all buying plants like crazy because of the pandemic. So I think that's why we saw more of this, but this is what the lesions are gonna look like on potato. Um, we did get um, late blight in my garden area and um, it did affect all the potatoes. Um, so it's something that if you have it, you rotate crops, you don't put potatoes, tomatoes, or any other members of the Solanaceae family into that area for about three years. Um, these are my plants. So that was my tomato plant. And um, anyway, so just something else to watch out for. And of course, remove the affected plant. Crop rotation is the key. You can use a fungicide, but I um, don't use a fungicide in my vegetable garden. 
but I was reading today about this and there actually are tomato cultivars in this mountain magic. That's one that I think all of you and Paige should grow and then send me an email and let me know how well it does. Um, but it's like a new cultivar that's been developed and there's a whole series of them. And one of our uh, farmers in Flagstaff had this mountain magic. And um, I don't know how successful she was, but I'd never heard of it before, but um, I think it's a more compact plant. Um, but anyway, it says it has resistance to late blight. So these other ones, I have to tell you, I never even heard of these plants. So uh, lemon drop, hmm, I've heard of lemon boy. So it might be a little bit of a challenge to track down some of this plant material. So we have a couple bacterial problems. The biggest one is bacterial wilt. Um, it can happen on tomatoes, um, squash, et cetera. There's no chemical control. But when you think you might have a wilting problem and you wanna know, is it a fungus problem or is it a bacterial problem or is it a virus? You can snap off the branch and then stick the stem in water and you'll see this streaming stuff come out and it's called bacterial streaming. And that's an indication you're looking at the bacteria. And so that's um, actually a sign that that's the problem. And if you, if you don't see this, then you might have a fungal problem or a virus problem. But again, there isn't anything you can do about it. If it's bacterial, well, you just need to get rid of all that plant material. And this is what it looks like in squash. So when Gail and I visited um, the Payson Community Garden, did those squash plants have bacterial wilt? Or did they have squash bug or did they have a virus? They never did figure that problem. But sometimes you can break the stem apart and you can see the bacteria streaming when you split that stem. So um, there's a couple ways you know, that you can figure this out, but it's still bad news because you have to get rid of the plants. Then we have um, diseases caused by viruses. They usually cause this, this modeling of the leaves. Um, the biggest one is beet curly top virus and that we're seeing throughout the state. And it's transmitted by this little beet leaf hopper that we talked about earlier. And so you'll see um, yellowing leaves. This guy's a sucking insect. So you'll see that the leaves are cupped, plants are stunted. And so sometimes you might need to control the insect problem, or you might need to cover the plants for a few weeks. Um, and one of the biggest problems is um, having weeds that can harbor the virus and then the beet curly or the beet leaf hopper feeds on the weed and then feeds on your um, vegetable plants. And that's just what a row, you know, an insect barrier would look like. And here's just some of the cupped leaves that you might find. And then I think this is the last one I have. So this is tomato spotted wilt virus. And so these tomatoes down here, those are my tomatoes. And I'm pretty sure that's what I had. I never sent it to a lab, um, but you see this modeling of the leaves. So again, this is not seed borne, but it's transmitted by thrips. There's thrips everywhere. And so I, I didn't realize that until today that this virus is transmitted by thrips the solution would be to control the thrips. I only had it that one year, I've never had it since. So um, it could be just one of those you know, things um, that I just happened to have a lot of thrips that happened to have it that year, but um, the tomatoes weren't attractive. So it wasn't something I wanted to eat. So anyway, stop the share. That's what I have for you today and I have Nine minutes, I'm happy to answer your questions. And so um, you have Gail's contact, you have me. We, we, if you have vegetable problems, we can't just hop in the truck and come visit you, even though we might like to, um, especially if you have a boat, if you have a boat. <laughs> <laughs> but what I really like is when people send pictures and that's how, um, I mean, sometimes if there was a big problem, and we were allowed to, we would hop in the car or hop in the truck and go up. But I like it when people send pictures um, and we've been able to identify some problems and come up with some 
solutions for folks. So um, I'm happy to do that. Um, it actually, you know, you sit in front of the computer writing a report and then somebody sends you a picture of a tomato plant that's struggling and you feel like, yes, I need to, this is way more important than my report. So we would be happy to help, right, Gail? So I know that was a lot of information and um, I think maybe somebody, I was listening to something about um, having a, like a, you know, like um, the recording of this, um, just the audio recording, having it transcribed so that you could have a written copy, but I think most of the words would be spelled wrong. So I think we won't invest in doing that. Okay. Oh. Thank you so much, Hattie. That was really good. Um, well, thanks. If anybody has any questions, feel free to just unmute yourselves and ask Hattie, or you can unmute yourselves and tell her. If you want to share your vegetable gardening success stories, we like to hear about that too. Maybe you've already done that. I just wanted to say thank you for sharing some of your pictures because I think we've experienced all those different things happening in our gardens, um, both on the, we lived in Connecticut for a long time and then coming here. I was so horrified when I had tomatoes and I had a hornworm. I was like, where did you come from? We're in the middle of a desert. And you know, and to know that I'm not the only one, it makes me feel better. Yeah. The first time I saw one, I was absolutely shocked, you know, cause they're gigantic. Mm -hmm. And where did it come from? Mm -hmm. So where do they come from? <laughs> Especially in Page, they they trek across the the desert. Mm, I think they're everywhere because they're big moths. So I actually don't know. I don't have an answer. Mm -hmm. So is that when we kill them when they're moths? Find the moths. Well, you usually don't. They're really really neat moths. You usually don't. You kill them when you find them eating your tomato plants. But the problem is, is that it's so big, so it's kind of gross. Um, yeah. So maybe at the egg stage or the the smaller larval stage. But I've never, I've never seen. I don't know what they look like when they're smaller. I've only ever seen the big ones. And um, did you guys have the moth infestations over the last couple of years? Because we've had a really bad problem in Page in the springtime. This last yeah, spring that's, wasn't as bad, but the previous spring was just huge clouds of moths. I don't know. Yeah, so that's the Miller moth. And I have to say that when I first got my job in 2003, we had dozens and dozens of phone calls from Paige about that. I haven't had a phone call since. And so I didn't know about it last year. And I honestly can't remember anything about that moth. So I might look it up and I'll tell Gail and she can um, let you know next week because I just don't remember. Uh, Is it worth preemptively spraying your plants with some of these items you spoke about? No, no. And I think it's, um, I don't believe it's a problem. Not for the moths, but just in general, because We've had so many different things, but. Yeah, so it's really better to know what you want to spray for because you could be killing beneficial insects. You could be creating a bigger problem. Um, I, I know that people sometimes, you know, say, well, I'm just going to get ahead of it, but you could be just putting out the wrong product um, and using a lot of product that could just harm other things. And so that's why we like to say, well, try, you know, pay attention to your plants, um, monitor them, and then try to um, treat them when they're small. Um, and so that's how we've just, it, you know, really not used as many um, toxic chemicals, but because many growers follow a integrated pest management, it doesn't mean whether you're organic or not organic, it just means you time the application of your product more carefully so that it's in infective. Gail mentioned this in her, I'm getting all these classes a little confused right now because we have so much stuff going on. But the one last night was um, for Flagstaff. Um, but you mentioned the, the, the um, insect um, pesticide or fertilizer with um, um, pesticide in it. 
And so um, you can buy a, you know, a three in one rose product that has a fungicide, a pesticide and a fertilizer in it. But the problem with that is it's great, except you might be applying a pesticide when it actually, you don't even have a pest or it's at the wrong time for the pest. And that's why the use of pesticides and fungicides is the timing is really key for it to be effective. And so um, I had kind of forgotten about that, but I have used that three in one rose product and um, it's a great pesticide, um, but do I need a fungicide? Usually not, we don't have that many fungal problems on roses. So that's our recommendation for using stuff. Okay, well, this has been fun zooming into Paige. Thank you. And, uh, Thank you very much. Yeah, we appreciate it very much. And um, yeah, I'll see you again tomorrow night. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll see you all next week for our last class, which is going to be um, about community supported agriculture. And I'll be presenting and so will Alyssa. And she's just going to talk about how they got the um, farmer's market started and what it's looking like for this year. Who knows with COVID, but um, also um, we might talk about the future community garden as well. So I will cool. see you next week. Okay. Thank you. Thank you nice meeting everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.